you know, what happens is like, there's always the next hot thing that VC money is after. And I see too many founders that just keep jumping from hot thing to hot thing. And then ultimately, you know, aren't building the thing that they would build for 10 years if nobody cared about. People looking back on it often think like, oh, this was like a COVID darling. And we did really well during COVID. But what most people don't realize is in 2017 and 2018, 2019, Cameo was the fastest growing consumer marketplace in the world. Like this was a company that when we grew 500% in 2020, that was the slowest we'd ever grown in a year. So like the math's the, actually the most compelling part of Cameo. One thing that I'll argue is that the talent on Cameo make more money per minute on Cameo than anything else in the world that they do. And we're expecting all these people to come to the site and nobody came to the site. Like zero, zero people. And it was actually worse than that. Cassius started getting trolled on his tweets. So all these people are like, you're a millionaire athlete. How selfish of you. This should be free. Why are you charging people? So then he kind of got blood hurt. And then he's basically like, you guys, I'm out. And then so now the only town on the site has just quit. My co-founder, Martin, is an NFL agent. His only client is Cassius. Oh, yeah. And by the way, Cassius had just wrote a $25,000 check to be our first investor in the business maybe a week before. So now I'm down a co-founder, I'm down our only talent. And Devin and I are kind of like, shit, like what, you know, what are we gonna do? Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo, I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. Steven, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I mean, look, we've had like a lot of classic B2B SaaS businesses here. And then we've had the cool ones so far have been like these robotics company. Like we had this uh, this one company, this robot that like kills weeds with lasers on farms. So like that was pretty cool. <laughs> but this is definitely one of those really cool ones because the platform is one that I think, you know, first of all, many people have just heard of Cameo. And second of all, it's one of those ideas you tell people and they're like, that makes sense. And also like, how can I use this? Right. So you can get Snoop Dogg or, you know, Jeremy Piven or whatever, like name your, your favorite actor, athlete, or whatever other superstar to, to kind of, you know, do a video for 15, 30 seconds a minute or whatever. So anyways, excited to kind of dig in to, uh, to how, how it'll happen. Maybe we can start there. Like, I think, you know, you started in what, like 2016 or so, like take us back just to, to that time and really the origin story around it because while it's an idea that I think makes sense when you hear it, not really like something obvious at all to, to come up with in the first place. Sure. Well, uh, again, thanks for having me and excited to share the story. We had the idea for Cameo at probably the last place that you would ever expect to have your billion dollar idea, uh, driving home from my grandmother's funeral. Uh, my co-founder Barton and I were uh, leaving uh, Chicago and this funeral home in Chicago and heading to O'Hare because he had flown in for LA for the day for the funeral. And while I was driving him home, he was telling me about a problem that existed for him. Uh, Martin had been an NFL, uh, a movie producer for years and had pivoted into becoming an NFL agent. And his main value prop to players was going to be, hey, if you sign with me, I'll find you off the field movies to get into and maybe I can make you a star. And his hope effectively was to take a big defensive lineman with a cool look and big personality and see if he could create the next, you know, Jason Momoa or The Rock and, you know, make them the next Conan the Barbarian uh, or Rambo. That was literally like what he was trying to do. Was he having like any success with this? Like, did, did he get any money in movies and things like that? He signed his first player, Cassius Marsh. And Cassius was like a third or fourth round draft pick out of UCLA. Uh, he ended up on the Seattle Seahawks, and he has the look. Like, when you see Cassius, like, he looks like a superhero. He looks like someone that could be in movies. And Martin was pulling his show phone out just to show me, like, a video of him. Like, look at him. Look at his swag. Like, look at the look. And while watching it, this I was watching this video. In the video, uh, Martin's getting Cassius Marsh to congratulate his good friend Brandon on becoming a father for the first time. So the video, you know, imagine Cassius is driving in the car in Southern California. He's wearing a flat brim Seahawk hat, no shirt on, tatted up, you know, driving. And he's got this phone on while he's driving. He goes, hey, Brandon, it's Cassius Marsh from the Seahawks. Heard about your son, Maverick. If he gets your athletic ability, he'll be playing for the Seahawks one day. Go Hawks. And it turned out that Brandon is a was an executive at Nike at the time. 
uh, works with the biggest athletes in the world, LeBron James, Mike, you know, Michael Jordan, Kyrie, et cetera. But he absolutely loves the Seahawks, which are his hometown team. So Martin ended up, you know, sending this this video to him from from a player that was kind of a backup player. And he put it on Instagram and said it was the best gift he ever got. And as Martin's telling me that, it was kind of shocking that this guy that's high up on Nike would care about a backup player. But because it was personalized, because it was his favorite team, you know, it really, it was a pretty special moment. And immediately, like, the Eureka moment went off for me. And I'm like, Martin, forget about trying to get Cassius Marsh into a movie deal. Like, why don't we sell those? It, like, how short, I mean, you're describing kind of like what seems like very tight kind of time frame. Did it really happen like that quickly? Kind of this this Cassius video and then this Eureka moment? Yeah, it, it happened that that quickly. Um, I, I will say, like, as we were in the car, he was kind of lamenting the experience of being an NFL agent with a player that's not a superstar, namely, like, you're losing money, basically, right? So one small antidote that's kind of cool and related is that Cassius, a few weeks earlier, had gone viral on the internet because he's an avid Magic the Gathering player, and someone had broken into his car and stole all his Magic cards. So he ended up going on Twitter, and he said, hey, 12s, which is what Seahawks fans call each other. Uh, I don't know what he thought was in that bag, basically money, guns, etc. But like what was in there is more important to me than anything in the bag or the bag itself. Just give me my cards back, and I won't press charges, basically. And I'll let you keep the, the Louis Vuitton bag they're in. And – you know, that was a viral moment. Like I remember that was on PTI and they were talking about Barstool and here's this big defensive lineman making Magic the Gathering, you know, maybe the nerdiest card game in the world. You can't make this stuff up, man. That's crazy. (laughs) But Martin couldn't even get Wizards of the Coast, which is the Seattle-based company that makes Magic to sponsor cash, to give them an endorsement deal. So that's was where we started uncovering some of the problems in sports. Like the top 1% of athletes make 99% of all the endorsement revenue. So here's someone like Cassius Marsh that is a diehard fan of Magic the Gathering, and yet Magic at that time wasn't interested in making him a paid endorser of their product. So you think that these videos, like that there's something compelling here, I guess that people will pay for them. What's your next step? Like, as I understand, you're your co-founder. You can't, you're not like tech guys. You're kind of like me. Like you're, you might have an idea. You can't do shit about it. So. <laughs> it wasn't even necessarily that we thought there was, we didn't know how much people would pay for them or what the market was. It wasn't even about that. But what we knew was that this video like elicits an immense amount of joy. And it just felt like something that should exist. And the insight we had immediately, like in that car ride, was like, hey, the selfie is the new autograph. When you see someone famous today, you pull out your phone and you want something to go on your, you know, your Instagram, uh, you know, your Instagram grid or your Facebook wall. Like that's what you wanted. Back in the day when you met somebody, you pulled out the Sharpie from your pocket. They signed the menu. They signed their shirt and went on your physical wall. But People in this you know digital age, they want something that they can share with their social networks. But the like, so you knew it was a compelling moment. You didn't necessarily know that there'd be like a business opportunity behind it. Yeah, like it just felt like something that should exist, right? And you know, and then uh, right after I dropped Martin back off at the airport, he goes through security. He calls me uh, right when he gets through security, and basically we start jamming on the idea. And right as he gets on the plane, he's like, "Hey." you got to get to LA. Like, let's keep this going. So I actually booked the next flight to LA the next morning. He picked me up. Uh, we went right to Soho house. We must've killed 10 picantes, you know, we're, we're drinking these spicy margaritas and we're dreaming up the marketplace that would become cameo. And the core idea that we had was for X amount of money as a fan, you should be able to pay to do Y activity with Z athlete. We were just athletes at the time that we had the idea and that, you know, it felt like that was a big idea. Like you should be able to pay to go to lunch with them or to FaceTime them. So it was more broad than just like... It was all these things, but like we kept coming back to the video is one of the many things that you could do, but probably the easiest to execute, right? Because we're asking relatively little for them. If you're going to go book someone to come to lunch with you, that's a lot of their time. But, uh, you know, 30 to 30 second to 60 second video, it's kind of selling the smallest amount of their time but it's something that could have a really big impact because it can be shared. 
So what, what do you do from there? Like, are you guys kind of like, do you, do you know about like lean startup methodology? Like, are you in the VC startup scene where you kind of know like what to do? Or are you just kind of like put one foot in front of the other and, and, and kind of see, see what happens? I was working at LinkedIn, but like I really didn't know anything about the lean startup methodology. I didn't know about things like Y Combinator. I didn't. Uh, I knew that there was this tech accelerate uh, incubator in Chicago called 1871, and I'd been there before. Um, but again, that was like things other people were doing, and I didn't. I had some friends that had started companies, especially from college. But I, you know, I wasn't necessarily like talking to them every day. <clears throat> so I definitely. It's not that I had this startup startup bug. We had the idea. I'm a natural entrepreneur. I'd had other entrepreneurial ventures in the past, non-technical ones. But in this case, like, you know, suddenly we're two guys with an idea, right? Two non-technical guys with an idea. (laughs) And the first thing I did was I called the best engineer that I knew, uh, Devin, and and talked to him about the idea and and, and got him to agree to, to kind of code it for the best friend price of, I think, $150 an hour to make the MVP. And did you wait for the MVP before you launched or did you already start like validating it and getting like athletes yeah, on board? Well, the MVP at the beginning was really just like a front end, uh, almost like a Google form type website. Like today when you go to Cameo, there's you know tens of thousands of talent on there. You can watch videos, you can see reaction videos. There's a lot to do. But back in that era, there really wasn't that much to do. It was like, we had no talent. We had no past videos. So it's kind of like, here's the, you know, here's the one person, Cassius Marsh, that agreed to be on the site. And here's all the things you can do. You can buy his merch. You can... Was that really V1? Like, actually, that was one of my main questions. Like, did you go out and get supply first? Or did you just like leverage the one guy you had with as many tasks? We launched with one person, right? And <laughs> That's crazy. I always say like, Holy shit. I, I, I see so many founders often that are like, well, you know, we need more people to get on or we need the app to be further along. Like, let me tell you how like Bush League our launch was. <laughs> we had one talent, Cassius Marsh, who had never done a video before. When when the first customer ended up like booking, there wasn't an app yet on the talent side. So we actually would email the talent and tell them like, hey, in your Gmail, like record a video and then email it back to us. And then we'll put a watermark on and send it to the customer. So the only website that we had at the beginning was a front-facing customer one that basically was just like, what's your name? What's the video? Like, who's what do you want the video to say? And yeah, Stripe integration. How did you even, let me ask this, like, I actually want to get really specific here because if you only have caches, does your website even talk about booking talent or was it just like almost like a website for him? (laughs) Like for, you know what I mean? For like, what do you want him to do? One of the ideas, like the LinkedIn bio space has now become like a cottage industry, but we were one of the first to, to basically tell talent, we don't need you to promote Cameo, this service. Uh, we need you to just promote your own page. So what we did is we gave everyone like their equivalent of a homepage. So it almost served as a like a white label storefront and, you know, Cameo.com slash cash was like his offering. Like at first you just had that one kind of story. Yeah, exactly. Right? We just asked him to tweet that out. And then over time, we ended up like building, you know, more classic homepage and, you know, search and discovery and browse and all the things that come with having more than an end of more than one in your marketplace on the supply side. Do you remember what one of the, like, what were some of the first few things that people bought with cash is, was it, was it, Videos or was it actually other things? Yeah, the very first thing we actually sold were were Cassius Marsh socks and a Cassius Marsh mug, so a little customized merch. And um, Cassius has this big polar bear tattoo, and like his nickname, you know, was the polar bear. So we put it on socks and we put it on a mug, and like that's literally the first thing we sold. So you have him. It's kind of starting to like work a little bit. Is your next step then to drive? more demand or now do you go to like 10, 20? Yeah. Well, we, one thing we always had high conviction about was in our marketplace, supply ought to be able to be, get their own demand. We knew that the best way to get Cassius Marsh booked would be for him to promote to his 76,000 Twitter followers that he had at the time. And to basically say, here's what I'm doing and like, come and get one for me. And I'll, I'll tell you like our launch uh, story, you know, maybe the worst launch story I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> Like as far as like what a disaster it was. I'll never forget. I was in Scottsdale, Arizona on launch night. Which is when, by the way, what year are we talking about now? This is mid-March 2017. So we'd had the idea October 5th, 2016. About six months later, we're like ready to, 
ready for prime time. I'd left LinkedIn by this point. You know, I'm all in. Like, we hadn't sold one yet, but like, I'm still bootstrapped, right? Like, uh, you hadn't raised anything. Yeah, still, still bootstrapped at this point. And, and basically the idea was like, let's, you know, let's have Cassius tweet out that video that gave us the idea and basically say, hey, I'm making cameos now. Or, you know, I think at the time I'm on this thing called Cameo. If you want a video like this, you know, 20 bucks, I'll do it for you. And, and he sends tweet, he hits the tweet button. Him and my two co-founders are in Devin's apartment in Venice Beach, California. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona with my buddy, Sean Fox. And we're trying to sign Jason Kipnis, like the second person to ever join Cameo at a dinner. So I'm at the steakhouse in Scottsdale and literally I'm, I'm, I'm pitching, I'm having a talk, but I have Google Analytics up on my phone and there's two dots, one in Scottsdale, one in Venice. It's time for Cassius to send the tweet out. And we're expecting all these people to come to the site and nobody came to the site, like <laughs> zero, zero people. And it was actually worse than that. Cassius started getting trolled on his tweets. So all these people are like, you're a millionaire athlete. How selfish of you? This should be free. Why are you charging people? So then he kind of got blood hurt. And then he's basically like, fuck you guys, I'm out. And then, so now the only talent on the site has just quit. He's gone. My co-founder, Martin, is an NFL agent. His only client is Cassius. Oh, yeah. And by the way, Cassius had just wrote a $25,000 check to be our first investor in the business maybe a week before. So now Martin's freaking out. Like, I just lost my only, you know, client money. And as an agent, you're supposed to put money in their pocket, not take it out. So then he stormed out. So both of them. So now I'm down a co-founder. I'm down our only talent. Wow. And Devin and I are kind of like, shit, like what, you know, what are we going to do? And then we're like, you know what? Maybe we should have not done this at 10 p.m. Eastern time. Like maybe we should have done it earlier. Like we were talking about like maybe a Tuesday night wasn't bad. Let's try it again on Thursday. Like we were talking about like different things. And then all of a sudden I'm like, well, maybe Google's not working. So I remember signing off the site and, the, and Devin's like, the dot disappeared in Scottsdale. And then when I signed back on, it came there. So it's like, nope, Google's working. Just nobody wanted to come to the site. And, you know, long story short, uh, what must have only probably been 15 or 20 minutes, but felt like 15 or 20 hours, a dot popped up in Renton, Washington, which is right by the Seattle Seahawks facility. So all of a sudden, I'm like elbows on the table. I'm like leaning in. What are they going to do? Gonna- one dot is in like one user. Like that's what you're talking about. One user's on there and they're on for like what felt like hours. And and at this point, there's nothing to do. It's like enter the name, put, you know, put your request in and like literally put your credit card in. There was nothing else to do. And it's like we're waiting and waiting and waiting. All of a sudden the dot just disappears. No purchase came through. And we're just gutted. You know, like I really felt like I got kicked in the balls there. Then all of a sudden my phone vibrates and I get a I get a notification on Twitter. This guy DMs me and he's like, hey, I'm trying to buy a cameo from Cassius Marsh. He's my daughter's favorite player, but your payment processor is not working. So at that point, I'm like, just tell me what you want to say. Like, we'll figure it out. He's like, my daughter's birthday is Thursday. This was like a Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday night. And, you know, then I remember like sending the message to Cash and Martin. They were both like so mad at me. They did. Neither of them responded. We missed the birthday. A week goes by. We missed the birthday. And finally, like, I'm like, Cassius, can you just please do this? Like, I understand you're mad, but like, let's just do this for this little girl. And he makes what I today think is one of the worst cameos I've ever seen. (laughs) Hey, Reese, thanks for being a fan. Sorry I missed your birthday. It was just terrible. Oh, God. No energy. I didn't even want to send it. It's like a week, two weeks late. But I sent it to the dad. And then sure as shit, like two hours later, I I get him a video I get from him a video of him having his daughter who half her hair is green, her half her hair is blue. She's oh, in wow. a Cassius Marsh jersey watching this video and she starts crying. She's so happy. And that was the moment where I'm like, oh shit, we got something here. Because if you can make one person feel like that, you could make millions or billions of people feel like that at scale. And does that make its way back to Cassius? Does that have the impact that you were hoping for? Yeah, not, and not just Cassius, but everybody else. Like, you can imagine the earliest days of starting a marketplace like Cameo, you have the classic chicken and the egg question. You have no talent on the platform, right? So as I'm telling people, hey, wouldn't it be cool for Michael Jordan to wish you a happy birthday? They're like, oh, I'd love that. How much? Well, we don't have him yet. Well, who do you have? We don't have anybody. 
<laughs> but imagine go the talent. Hey, you can connect with your fans. You can make money. You're going to get paid to become more beloved. Well, who's on it? How? Who's done the best? Nobody, right? So that's a really tough thing. So we relied on kind of personal relationships, friends and family that we knew. Like I, I went to Duke and as did Devin, and a lot of our friends were, you know, former NBA, like future NBA players and NFL players. And Martin was an athlete at USC, so you know he knew people. So we started with our own network. And then how, what about the demand side? Cause like the, the one thing that puzzled me about the story, cause I would have agreed with your kind of hypothesis, which is like, they should drive their own demand. Right. And especially someone like cash who has like, you know, 70,000 Twitter followers, all this stuff. Like did, did he post again? And then this time it worked because you optimized something or was well, that what just happened is we logic? Kept adding more and more talent. Right. And then they would come on, they would post. And like, every time they posted these people would like, you know, a few people would come on. And then the other thing too, is like once someone bought, we learned right away, they're almost all gifts. So I buy for you, then you share on your Facebook, you share it on your Instagram, you share it on Twitter in a group chat. And then those people saw the Cameo watermark. They're like, what the hell is Cameo? And that was it. So it's really this flywheel of talent coming on, promoting, somebody booking, they share it with the person they book for. And then that person has to like the content to share it enough. So that's where like the, you know, the, the K factor comes from every one of these videos. How long did, did it take for you to start feeling that? Cause obviously there's a point at which you, you know, you really kind of took off, but I mean, from the moment that you launched to the moment that you feel like, okay, this is taking momentum. That first month, month, like March, uh, 2017, we did like 144, dollars in GMV and keep in mind our take rates 25%. Right. <laughs> I don't even think we could have me, Devin and Martin could have bought ourselves lunch that first That's month. Right. But then the next month we did $450. And it's like, all right, you know, three X growth. Then we did a thousand dollars in month three. Then, you know, we did like four thousand dollars in month four. And then we did eight thousand dollars in month five. And then we went from eight thousand to thirty six thousand. And by the by December we did a hundred thousand in a month. So like it was, you know, it was growing insanely fast. In Cameo, often, like now, like people looking back on it, often think like, oh, this was like a COVID darling. And we did really well during COVID. But what most people don't realize is in 2017 and 2018, 2019, Cameo was the fastest growing consumer marketplace in the world. Like this was a company that when we grew 500% in 2020, that was the slowest we'd ever grown in a year. That's insane. Yeah, I mean that just that ramp even on that first year is is a uh, very, very high growth, very and, compelling. And keep in mind too, we did this without marketing spend, which I think is really interesting. Like, there's not a lot of marketplaces. What marketplaces often have to do is they'll acquire supply side or demand, whatever's the harder side, and then they'll spend money to get the other side. In our case, what we ended up doing was hiring a bunch of like fresh out of college kids and interns to be DMing celebrities all day. So we never paid the celebrities to join. But what we did was we we invested in our supply side and then that became demand. But, you know, it was, you know, we were doing probably north of 100 million in GMV before we even really started spending money on paid. Were there any like major in those first 12, 24 months, any kind of major celebrities you landed that you remember like being kind of an inflection point? There, there kept being different inflection points. Like the, the first major one was uh, when Cody Ko joined. Uh, Cody Ko is one of the biggest YouTubers on earth. He had also happened to be one of my fraternity brothers and me and, and Devin, my co-founder's roommate. And at the time when Cody joined, we were just doing uh, NFL players, basically. And we started with, you know, pro athletes only. And then one day Devin's like, I think Cody and people like Cody might do well on Cameo. And when Cody joined, he put it in a YouTube, on his YouTube channel. He probably had a you know, few million followers at the time. And that was like, like just the first time the site went viral when Cody came on, um, you know, shortly after that, uh, Dennis Rodman came on, which like was the first talent that really was like press worthy. This was probably like a year and a half kind of into the business. And I remember like the Chicago Tribune was the first paper to write about Cameo. And, and the headline was for $200, Dennis Rodman will wish you happy birthday. And like that was bold and intriguing and him coming on. Uh, ended up being big. And then probably right after that, like Brett Favre is one of those people that just, you know, this guy is a Hall of Famer and someone that was like so popular in pop culture. And and just like when a Brett Favre's on, it's hard for any athlete at the time to say like, I'm bigger than him or I'm bigger than Cameo. When did he join? What year? Do you remember? 
uh, Brett was on in 2018. So oh, th- there just okay. kept being like these things. And then by 2019, when Snoop Dogg joined, like that was kind of, you know, for entertainment and pop culture, there's just not many people in the world bigger than Snoop. And, you know, and that was kind of, you know, even before he did the Olympic stuff, before any of that. But like we just, you know, every day there just keeps being kind of the next talent that blows their mind in some way. And how do you make the math work? I understand that, you know, it only takes 30, I mean, it only takes 30 seconds, a minute, maybe they record a couple of times, like two, three minutes, and you make a few hundred dollars, or maybe a thousand dollars. But like, I think it's someone like Snoop or Brett Favre, like making like whatever they make, like real, real money. Like, how do you make it worth it for them to do this for 10 minutes a day or however, however they think about it? Look, the math's the, actually the most compelling part of Cameo. Interesting. One thing that I'll argue is that the talent on Cameo make more money per minute on Cameo than anything else in the world that they do. So as an example, Andre Drummond was one of the first like max salary NBA all-stars to join Cameo in the really early days. He was making $25 million a year. I remember talking to him and asking him, like, hey, Andre, like, would, are you interested in this? Because he went to high school at Devon. They're from the same area. And he's like, yeah, I'd do it, but I'd probably need like 40 grand. I'm like, like explain that math or, or I, I'd probably need 10 grand to do it. I'm like, explain that math to me. He's like, well, I should, I went to this bar mitzvah for, you know, 40 grand a few years ago. And, um, and I think this is like, I'd probably need 10 grand for this. So then I broke the math down. I'm like, you make 25 million a year, divide by 2000 hours in a work year, 50, 40 hour weeks, divide by 60. Do you know how much money you make per minute? He's like, I have no idea. I'm like you make two hundred and eight dollars per minute as a max salary NBA player. So if you could charge a hundred or one hundred fifty bucks per video, and on Cameo you could do two videos per minute, you can make the same amount or more on Cameo at a hundred dollar price point than you make in the NBA as a max salary. And this is exciting because instead of a mom, single mother paying, you know, for tickets and popcorn and hot dogs, you know, and, and Coca Cola to go see your son. You know, for her son to go see you play for your birthday, you literally could give him a better present, more personalized for cheaper. And like, that was a wow. And how do they think about it? Like, so that makes sense to me. But then there's something about just the fact that, okay, but how many of these am I really going to do? Because even though in a minute I can make, let's say a lot per minute more or as much as my salary, you know, my salary is is, 2 million a month, like versus how many videos am I really going to do? Like how, and how do these guys, I'm just curious, like, how do they end up working? Do they take like an hour a week and just like crush through or what? Like it depends. Like, but you know, some of the math that's kind of compelling is like, if you do $3,000 a day on Cameo, that's a million dollars a year. Right. And to actually like break it down, if you're looking at something like Brett Favre, Brett Favre's 400 bucks a video, you know, he can do 10 minutes of Cameo a day to make a million dollars a year. Right. Like that, <laughs> and that, it's pretty compelling. It, the, the tougher thing ends up being like we're probably more demand side constrained than we are supply side constrained. So we have plenty of talent that would do more cameos. And in fact, if you were to ask our talent, what's the number one thing you wish you could change about the platform? They're like, I want to get booked more. Right. So top of funnel is still, um, you know, eight years in still something that, you know, we're, we're really like trying to figure out like we see. Our, our top line GMV is almost 100% correlated to like session traffic. Like it's, it's crazy. Year after year, like when sessions are up, you know, the business is up. If sessions are down, the business is down. But like the, it's, it's, so, it's, it's actually crazy when you look at the session numbers to GMV and how correlated it is. And it's something we've seen, you know, always. So then it, it kind of gets back to like, what are we doing to get more traffic to the site? So a lot of what we've spent the last few years on is giving talent better sh- tools to share so they can go right in their app and create, you know, TikTok, Instagram posts that, you know, look like super well designed and they're great and they can put it out there and turn their followers into our customers, right? Because that's what this business is all about. And today is Cameo, is gifting still like the number one reason people will pay for Cameo? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, Gifting, um, over 85% of cameos are bought for others, number one. And then among, you know, among all the videos, like over half of them are birthdays still. Do you do anything on the demand side besides just getting supply to kind of push it out just to be more top of mind, like on, you know, and I don't know enough about like the gifting space to know how 
companies that know that they're mainly gifts do this, but it's like to capture people when they're like gonna, you know, they, they even think that this is an idea. Cause actually like, you know, as on the user side, I'm just like an average user. I've seen cameo, like I've been exposed to it before, but there's a difference between that and me, like thinking of gift for someone and even remember like, Oh yeah. Like what about a cameo from this person? Like, I'm sure she would love it. I'm like, I'm sure you would love it. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think there's like a ton of ways. PR has been a really big lever for us uh, over the years. Um, you know, we're really prominent in gift guides. So was, you're like, hey, 10 great gifts for dad for Father's Day. Like you're going to see us on those things. But really nothing's better than word of mouth. You know, it's like our happy customers sharing it with their friends and family. Like that's how most people discover us. Got it. That makes sense. So I think, I mean, you know, I would argue, especially for a marketplace, like once you start kind of seeing that ramp late, 2017, 2018, there's clearly like a level of product market fit. <clears throat> My understanding of your business is it just kind of kept growing, as you said, like in 2020, even though it was growing very fast, it was actually the slowest growth. Um, walk me through, because obviously like, you know, the paradigm for, I mean, the macro changed a lot since COVID and 2022 and, and, and on. And a lot of companies have had to, um, well, some have had to completely shut down, but certainly like reprise, do a bunch of different things. Like I, I'm curious for you personally, what it was like kind of hitting unicorn status, raising a hundred million dollar round. Was that something you took to heart or was that just like a, whatever, there's no difference between this round and the last round is just one more round. Like, I'm just curious to get into your frame of mind uh, when that happened in in 2021. When we became a unicorn by that point, it was much more of an inevitable thing. Like I think where it really made a difference was actually like our series A and our series B rounds. Lightspeed led our series A and Mm -hmm. You know, the same team at Lightspeed led it that were the first investors in Snapchat. And Snap was going public right around that time. And I remember after our pitch meeting, uh, Jeremy Liu, who wrote the first check, walked in with Nicole Quinn, the partner that would join our board from Lightspeed. And he said, hey, Steven, it's unanimous. You know, the Lightspeed partnership wants to help build Cameo. Um, and we're going to offer you a term sheet today. You know, we've got deep conviction in, in, in this business. We think that Cameo is Snapchat, but bigger that Instagram can't copy, right? Like, and this is from the first check in that. So, I, well, we had Jeremy Liu on this podcast, by the way, really sharp guy, specifically talking about the investment in Snapchat. So it's an interesting uh, comparison. Anyways, I have other questions about that, but I can I can understand the significance of of those words from him. A lot of people don't know Cameo is headquartered in Chicago, and Chicago is a place that's really good at B two B SaaS and logistics. There's like certain not consumer, yeah. <laughs> but it is not like necessarily known for like consumer social. Now, marketplaces tend to be a strength. Grubhub was founded here. Groupon, you know, which was one of the biggest, fastest growing marketplaces of all time was here. Spot Hero, the biggest parking app in the world is here. So there's been big marketplace businesses built, but like there hadn't been a company like Cameo that ever came out of here. And because of that, like tier one investors just weren't investing in in Chicago. Um, It wasn't until just recently that Sequoia led a seed round in a company from Chicago. Lightspeed hadn't invested in Chicago and consumer since Grubhub Series A or Series B, whatever round they got in. So you're talking like 2004 to 2017, sorry, 2018, probably when we raised that. About five months after we raised that round, uh, Kleiner Perkins came in and it's like, Suddenly now, like this company in Chicago is getting anointed by Lightspeed and Kleiner. And that ended up being a really, really big deal from a recruiting perspective. Because look, Chicago has like there's enough people in Chicago to build any company you want. Uh, If you look at the 500 mile radius around Chicago, there's more software engineers produced in that circle than any other circle in the whole world. The problem is the region's been an ex- a net exporter of talent. So people go to Silicon Valley, they go to New York, they go to London, San Francisco. So it's always been about like, how do you build cool companies that the kids at University of Chicago and Michigan and Wisconsin and Illinois and Purdue and Northwestern, how do you get those kids to stay home? I was really excited as a Chicagoan, as someone that would have loved to have worked at a company like Cameo when I graduated Duke and came back to Chicago I took a lot of pride in like building that there. And it was really like, those were the rounds that kind of put us on another trajectory. By the time we were a unicorn, you know, we'd won every award in the world. Like we're fast growing. Like we had the brand recognition, you know, way before we didn't need like that 
that there. It was just kind of an inevitability. Of yeah, where it seemed I'm, inevitable by that point. That makes sense. Yeah, like we were just, you know, six months before we became a unicorn, the information ran Cameo, the, sing, the number one most promising company in consumer tech. So at that point, we weren't even thinking about that. We're thinking about IPO, right? Like, and just unicorn was like a, you know, box to check on the That's way. Right, a milestone, like, a stepping ball. stone. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me ask this, like when it came to the Series A and especially thinking about Jeremy Liu, like how did how did they think, maybe even less of what they thought, but like what did engagement and retention look like for Cameo in those in those early days? Like did you have a lot of repeat purchase that people keep coming back? How did you even think about that? Because it's not a typical, like Snapchat is you're supposed to do, use it every day. I mean, and you could see that in the early days, like Cameo was never supposed to be like that. So it, it was really early, and I'll, t- I'll tell you how Jeremy found out about Cameo. It's kind of a cool story. So we have this angel investor named Jana Masterschmidt. Jana was part of uh, the syndicate called Hashtag Angels, which were all the like female executives at Twitter that after the IPO you know, started investing in companies. She was a really early user of Cameo. She's obsessed with The Real Housewives. And she'd been DMing me on Twitter like every day for a month. Till I responded. And she basically is like, you have to let me on your cap table. I met her. I thought the world of her. I let her write a small check into our seed round. And then, I'll, you know, three months later, she calls me and she's like, hey, Stephen, uh, I'm having a party at my house in, in uh, Malibu. And Jeremy Liu, uh, I just introduced him to Cameo and he's stoked about it. Can I connect you guys? And my investors in Chicago at the seed stage, we'd created a basically a spreadsheet of like the best funds in the world and then the best partners there. And every individual partner at every top fund was ranked on a scale of like five being the highest one being the worst fit. And then, you know, A to D right. And, and there was only like five, five a people, you know, it was Reed Hoffman. It was Matt Kohler at benchmark. You know, it was Jeremy Liu. Like this was a, there was a tiny, tiny drop of people. These are not just the right firms, but these are the best investors at the firms to go do this. And Jeremy was like on that list. So of course I'm like, yeah, I'd love to meet him. So he sends me an email and he goes, Cameo's brilliant. We're having breakfast tomorrow. Where in the world are you basically? And I happen to be in San Francisco. So we meet at the battery. We have a quick chat and keep in mind at this point, we're probably doing tens of thousands a month in, in GMV by this point, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe like it would get up to a hundred thousand by the time that process was over. But like, that's, kind of the, the revenue rate. very early still right you know we were in year one i think we did 300k in gmv we did 4 million in year two so this was that 300k to 4 million year so 10x growth that year and that's around the time where where i met jeremy and i remember like i, I sit down to talk to him at the battery we're scheduled for 15 minutes i think i'm doing this like rapid pitch i'm maybe 10 seconds into my pitch he goes steven no 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 I know what you're doing, and I've been looking for a business like this for 10 years. Let me explain to you why we're the perfect partner. And we spent the next three hours talking about what we could build and what Cameo could be and dream. And I had to go. It was Labor Day weekend, and I had to get back to LA for a wedding. So I had a flight, and you know, I'm like, Jeremy, I got to go. So before I leave, Jeremy's like, all right, Stephen, uh, when you land in LA, you're on American. You're landing at gate 45. I need you to walk over to the United Terminal you know, gate 72, you're going to meet my partner, Nicole Quinn there. No way. So I literally land, I walk over there, Nicole Quinn and I Come talk on. and like, it's just kind of love at first. I mean, like she gets it. She's excited. She had just joined the board of Lady Gaga's company and Gwyneth Paltrow's company. So she was, she just got it, you know, and, and her and Jeremy got it. And at the end of that, she's like, all right, Stephen, um, this is Labor Day weekend. She's like, Tuesday, we're going to fly to Chicago to come see you guys in the office. Right. So like, I always tell this story to founders that when a VC, like especially in consumer, when they get it, like you know if they're if they're into it, like they will move heaven and earth to come track you down and find you and learn about your business. So by the time like I made it out to Silicon Valley, you know, I hadn't even met other investors yet. Like we get that term sheet from Lightspeed, that partner meeting the next that following Monday. And then, you know, all my VCs are like, all right, well, we need to go build some FOMO and competition. And I ended up with five term sheets in the next four days because again, it's like people just felt our product. It was just, and, and the thing that was cool for us always, and, and we didn't have a deck at the series A, we didn't have the deck in the series B. You know, the reason that they understood it was like, they were users of the product, 
you know, they'd used it. They'd been playing around with it. Like they'd gotten it for their partners or someone gets promoted or retired. So it's always way easier in consumer when your VCs have used your product. Well, it's funny you say that because that was the almost the opposite with Snapchat. He, you know, for where it's where like Jeremy Liu gets told by his senior partner to look at it. And it was because his senior partner seen his daughter use it. And like the whole thing Jeremy Liu had trouble with was like, I don't fucking get it. <laughs> like he tried to use it. He's like, this is so stupid. But, you know, ultimately he got it and whatever. But I understand with Cameo and 100%, like when it comes to consumer, if somebody falls, like if an investor falls in love with your product, the odds that he or she will be, you know, want to invest are just much higher. And, and the opposite is true as well. And, and especially like, you know, when you start a pitch meeting out of like, oh, I bought a cameo for my dad for his 70th birthday. It's the best thing I've ever gotten him. That's a pretty warm way to start. The yes, meeting. definitely. <laughs> you know, back to my question, I guess then in his case was was based a lot on on just kind of thesis and understanding where this could go. But I am curious just in general, like the engagement question, the retention stuff. So back to your engagement question, we're a marketplace business. We're not expecting people to come on. But the things that Lightspeed was excited about, Kleiner was excited about, and then our, in our Series C, people were excited about, was on the supply side, we had net negative churn. So not only were the, like our talent cohorts, we were growing every single month when you looked at our waterfall. So that was great. Uh, in the early days, and, and honestly, even to this day, the, the biggest red flag would have been consumer retention, right? We had an NPS that was in the 80s or 90s. It was like as high as any product, but people were, you know, were not buying like every day. You know, in fact, people were buying maybe once, you know, once or twice in their entire life cycle. So that was always kind of, if you were ever bearish on Cameo, it was always customer retention. But, you know, the the the, the bullish bet would be like, there's 8 billion people in the world. You know, they've sold like, tens of thousands of these or hundreds of thousands. It's so new, right? And the mat, the, the, the TAM here is so big that if the product is that beloved, like people will, they'll figure it out eventually. So that's kind of the, the bull and bear case for Cameo. Was there ever a, like a magic number? Like if somebody buys five Cameos and they're, they're way more likely to buy another one or just anything related to that? Not on the consumer side, but we've totally have that on this on the uh, talent side. If you did your first three cameos, like you're basically never going to miss them, right? So it was always important. We had a we had a, a metric called four and fourteen, which was like doing four cameos in your first fourteen days, like that kind of. If you did that, you were basically like locked into our platform for life. Um, so we would spend a ton of time on the supply side, you know, with that insight. You know, making sure we we activated talent is what we would call them when they hit that that metric. And so, walk me through. You went from 100k to four million to what in terms of GMV? To 20 to 100 in four years. Crazy. And is that was that kind of peak 100 million? No. You kept going beyond that. Yeah. And then what happens kind of post COVID that then leads to? Let's talk about what happened in COVID first because I think it's really important. So. Obviously, like COVID was a, was just such a crazy time in the economy. Like people can't travel. But in our business, every single athlete, actor, celebrity in the world was out of work all at the same time. And what people don't realize is like athletes get paid per game. So when they don't play, there's no game checks coming in. Musicians get paid per gig. So it's not like you or I that got to sit at home at work and continue to get paid. Like if you're not performing, you don't get paid. So this ended up you know, Cameo had been hot and, you know, we just had Snoop and all these people are coming on. So we started in the first few months of COVID just seeing an insane wave of like the Lindsay Lohans and Acon, like talent that we'd always wanted to come on, Charlie Sheen, like they're just, now they're just, everybody's just piling on and, and, and that, you know, continued to like just have the rocket ship propel even faster because the market just hit this tipping point. And on the same time on the consumer side, you had stimulus checks coming. And if you go look at the first week of COVID, our business dropped by 50% the first week of COVID. So I remember having an emergency meeting with my board and we're like, all right, we need to like we need to talk about layoffs and like how we're going to solve this thing. And here's all the benefits. And maybe we can cut the commuter pass because no one's going to work. And maybe we could cut the gym membership. Like we were literally like, you know, founders, we're going to take our salaries to zero. Like we like we were just like, what what do we need to save the business? And then a week later, you know, they announced, you know, I think stimulus checks started coming almost immediately. And then like, boom, business went up. And then, you know, if you think about it, 
from the consumer side, you know, like my mom's someone that has a cancer survivor. So she was one of these amino compromised people that you couldn't see. So for Mother's Day, I didn't get to see it. Right. So what'd you do? You bought her a cameo. Uh, there were no birthday parties. There was no going to concerts. There was no going to games. So on both the consumer side and on the uh, and on the demand side, I'm sorry, d- supply and demand side, you know, we kind of had these like insane tailwinds that brought the business up both sides. Now, when the world reopened, like what happened? Revenge spending, right? So instead of buying cameos, like people wanted to go to dinner, they wanted to go to a festival, or they wanted to go to the game. Uh, the you know every single musician that hadn't been able to tour for two years hit the road. They're touring. You know, there'd been two years of no movie production happening. There go, you know, everything's just going. So then at the same time, like stimulus checks are gone. Like we start to see, you know, this drop in traffic that comes on both the supply side and the demand side because the supply was more busy and the demand side was poorer because they were spending money. The world was opening. They were spending it on other things. And suddenly the cost basis of our business didn't make sense based on, you know, where the new reality was after COVID. We were still way bigger than we were prior to COVID, right? The business was four or five X what it was. But, you know, when you're growing on this path and people invest in you at a billion dollars, they expect that to go forever. And what we tried to do in that time with the money is hire the best team we could. We hired an elite executive team, you know, top execs from Uber and Airbnb and LinkedIn and McDonald's, like just amazing talent that we brought into the executive team. We then started building other businesses. You know, we went after a subscription business, kind of like an OnlyFans Patreon competitor. We had a, a Cameo Calls business, which was FaceTiming with talent. We built a Cameo Live business, which could help, you know, musicians or actors, you know, do live streams. But it was like really tailored, way better than Zoom for like a fan engagement. We started uh, international expansion. You know, people were trying to copy Cameo all over the world. Like, let's build Cameo Japan. Let's, you know get in the UK, let's, you know, like literally all over the world. So suddenly the company, we were in 38 states and, and 14 countries from an employee base and it got really big. And so How many people did you have? At our peak, we had, uh, we had 437 people and then probably another few dozen contractors around the world, right? So, you know, it was probably close to 500 people, right? And, and you know, we're, we're working on all these new, new business initiatives. We get an NFT unit. I mean, like we're, But like that, you know, at that point, like I said, we were looking towards IPO. So we were trying to, we need to have a really diversified revenue base. Um, And at that point, one of the things that we felt like really certain about was, was merch. You know, merch, as I mentioned, was the first thing we ever sold. We bought a company called Represent, the world's leading celebrity merch company. And we really felt like this could be a thing post COVID when talent were busier that could like stabilize our revenue stream. So suddenly we've got the merch business, we've got the core business, we have Cameo for Business, this B2B side, we have Cameo Live, we have Cameo Calls. Lots of things going on. Cameo past the NFT business. And our best people are kind of spread out on all the problems. And then when the business fell, the core business fell faster than the new businesses were able to make up the revenue. How much, by the way, like from peak to trough, like we're talking about a 20% hit, a 50% hit, like what kind of magnitude? We probably took about a 50% hit. Traffic was down maybe 60% at its like from peak to trough, you know, and, and that's tough because uh, OPEX went up three or four X in that time period, right? So that's where suddenly you go from being a, a profitable business in, you know, in, in mid 2020 to business burning five, six million a month all of a sudden, right? And yeah, you can raise a hundred million dollars, but if it's, you're burning five, six million a month, it doesn't last that long. That's right. And then the other thing is the, the valuations usually are like, especially when you're growing that fast, like they're always kind of these forward looking valuations and it was a hype time. So you're, everybody was getting high valuations. Like totally. When we raised that a billion businesses like ours were trading eight to 12 X forward net revenue. We were $75 million net revenue business. We got the 12 X multiple 900 million pre hundred million post billion. It wasn't even controversial. Our round was four. Yeah. That's actually not million. that like for that time, that's not that crazy. It really, we had real, we had real revenue, yeah, right? Exactly. There's a lot of companies in that time in the ZERP time that didn't have revenue or was like purely speculative. There were 30 X multiples on, on, on like for sure on air. Like yeah. We were, we had a, like a, a pretty like silver reasonable multiple. So our story wasn't that like we got priced too high. It's just that the market started like as traffic came down, our business just wasn't producing the same way it was. Right. And 
and you know, and that's just something that like it didn't go to zero. And like when you if you drew the line from 2019 to 2023 or 2024, like it's still a pretty good line if you didn't if you ignore what happened in the middle. But of course, you can't ignore that. Which, by the way, is like actually kind of the, the macro story. You look at most things. You look at e-commerce sales. You look at whatever, and it's kind of like this trend line up into the right, and then this crazy blip that's COVID, and then it just kind of keeps going on that trend line. And you know, like I think, I think for some businesses, there's like actual structural things that change that would lead to like a valuation coming down. But when we kept looking at ours, like the talent were still loving the platform and they were on it, and the customer NPS was still just as high. So it wasn't that we like. It wasn't that something else had popped in the market that made Cameo, you know, it wasn't cool anymore or everyone had bought it. You know, we've sold, you know, millions of Cameo, not tens of millions of Cameo or hundreds of millions of Cameos, millions, right? So this is still like a pretty small, you know, business. Uh, 14% of American adults have unaided awareness of Cameo and about 40% have aided. So there's still a ton of the market left to penetrate just here and forget about the rest of the world. So, you know, that was one thing that always gave us conviction is if we could get the cost basis right, like we have a real business here. And when we were doing as much top line as we were doing, we didn't need to be burning as much as we were. We could find a steady state of the business to get profitable and, you know, over three like really painful rounds of, of layoffs. That's what we were able to do. And the business has now been profitable for the last year. And so why was like the, the markdown, I mean, you, you look online, it's like 90% markdown recap. Like, why was it so aggressive? It feels like from outside looking in, almost like overdone. I'm curious, like what led to that or why did that make kind of the... It wasn't based on revenue, but like valuation is always just, it's supply and demand, right? So ultimately what happens in cases like this, especially when a lot of the money's coming from existing investors, is they're trying to dollar cost average, you know, the, the investments that they make. So if you invested at a billion and you get to reinvest at you know way less than a billion, then your at your entry multiple actually is like at a more reasonable place. You know that might the person that does both this most recent round and the Series C, their price is kind of like it's like they invested at a three or four hundred million valuation, right? So it's all it is. It's dollar cost averaging down, and it was just a factor of like what was the market clearing price for us to raise the amount of money that we needed, and you know part of it is. Uh, you know, our business to make the acquisition and take in some venture debt out with SVB, we needed to raise X amount of money to be able to restructure the debt. It was irrelevant what the price was. It was really like, what's it going to take to save the company? And, you know, and that's what we did. And then from the employee side, right? Like, look, from an investor side, and I'm both an investor and an employee in the company. So like I have every, I wear every hat here uh, as an investor, like, yeah, net, you never want to invest in something and have it go down that much. But as an employee, you got to remember, if you're someone building the company that joined at a billion dollar valuation, your strike price of your options is up there. All of a sudden, like, you know, everyone knows you couldn't sell for that. So you're underwater. So what are the nice things about bringing the valuation down is it actually enables you to reset the strike price for all of your employees. And suddenly, like, if you join Cameo today, it's like you joined at the Series A again. And, you know, and now you're going to get you know, you're going to get upside on, on bringing it back to a billion dollars. Correct. Yeah. But with much higher revenue and much higher, basically everything else. And so I like to tell everyone, it's like, like if someone's coming to work for us now and they're like, well, I saw in the paper that the valuation's down, like joining Cameo today is like joining a series A company that everyone in the world knows about, right? It's got like a public company, you know, kind of like brand. It's got hundred plus million dollars in GMV top line, right? Like it's profitable. There's not a lot of series A companies like that. So I think that's all true, but just to, just to be like, just for, for the sake of it, because I think a lot of founders, especially the ones that are kind of getting to product market fit, obviously have never gone through or thought about like a recap. Maybe if you could spend just a few minutes on like what that takes, what that was like, like how painful that really was. It seems to have all worked out ultimately. It's super painful. Um, you know, down rounds are always, you know, insanely painful. And I think, I think one of the things that I will say is that so many of the investors that have been in the industry for the last 15 years, they hadn't really seen like a full cycle. So a down round became a death sentence effectively for a long time. But like in the stock market, companies go up and down all the time. That's right. When we became a unicorn, Snapchat was worth over a hundred billion dollars it's worth like $8 billion today. It doesn't mean it's a shitty company. It's just like these things go up and down all the time. 
nobody wants to take the tough medicine because from a fund perspective, you know, cameo, if you invested early is, you know, maybe a, something that marked up your fund and maybe returned your fund, you know, on paper and you fundraised off of that. So, you know, a lot of people kind of delay taking the tough medicine or trying to do, let's do a convertible note or let's do something that like artificially, artificially keeps it. And then you have the issue of like liquidation preference and like, how do you continue to motivate the founders and the management team and the employees versus like keep your pref. So, I mean, look, it's, it's brutal. It's a really drawn out process. Um, I'm, you know, really happy for our company, like where we ended up for our employees um, you know, if you invested in this round, I think you've got a ton of upside, but people, some people chose to invest, some people chose not to invest. And, um, you know, and at the end of the day, like all that matters to me is that this business is continuing to grow. Uh, it's, it's stable, it's profitable, it's growing again, and it's going to continue to be, exist as a going concern. And if we didn't take the tough medicine, like we wouldn't be having this conversation right now because Cameo would have been gone. Well, let's stop it there. I know we're at the top of the hour. Let me just ask the two questions that we always end on. Um, so the first one, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'll ask anyways, which is when like, when was the moment when you personally felt like you'd found product market fit with Cameo? Yeah, the first time I saw the the first reaction video uh, of, of Reese Lane, um, you know, literally like crying because she saw Cassius Marsh. I just knew we had something. And then the last question is if you could go back in time to when you were starting Cameo with like a piece of advice for yourself or even like some common advice you tend to give founders these days, like what what would that be? I think the biggest thing is to make sure that you're building in your guy. So what's the intersection of what are you great at? What do you love to do? What does the world need and what can you get paid for? So often, and I've seen about six of these, six to eight of these cycles, micro mobility, AR, VR, Web3, you know, what happens is like, there's always the next hot thing that VC money is after. And I see too many founders that just keep jumping from hot thing to hot thing. And then ultimately, you know, aren't building the thing that they would build for 10 years if nobody cared about. So I think it's so hard to do what we do as founders that you need to make sure you're working on something like you, you care about when everybody cares about it and you care about it if nobody cares about it. Well, Stephen, thanks so much for jumping on the show. It's been great. Cool. Thanks, Pablo. I just gave you content that you liked so much, you actually listened to the end. And guess what? You didn't pay a single dollar. Not only that, I didn't even put any ads in your face. So you just got a bunch of content for free. And now that I've delivered that value, I'm asking for something in return. Open your app, Open Apple Podcasts, open Spotify, open whatever app you use to listen to this and hit that follow button. It's actually going to help you because it's going to help you make sure you don't miss out on the next episode, which you like so much that you listen to the whole thing.